now the YouTube is open. So. Okay. Now the YouTube is open. Okay. So we are online. Now the YouTube is open. <laughs> so we are we need to close it. Everyone close their YouTube. Uh, Ooh, Windows. Something YouTube open. Is it me? Okay, that, that's you, Katja, yeah. Sorry, I think it was me who had it open. So, but now the situation is solved.
few more minutes and we start. Okay, then I think the time is 11.15 and we are ready to start. It is a great honor and a pleasure for me on behalf of the University of Bergen and its Faculty of Mathematics and Natural Sciences to welcome you all to this doctorate thesis disputation ceremony for Neil Robert Anders. He was admitted to the PhD program at the Faculty of Mathematics and the Natural Sciences in January 2016 and has been supervised by researcher Michael Breen, Institute of Marine Research, Professor Two, a researcher Aurel Engos, Institute of Marine Research, researcher Audwold, Institute of Marine Re Research, and senior researcher Björn uh, Ruth Nufima. Neil Robert Anders has been a PhD candidate at the Department of Biological Sciences. On the 20th of December 2019, Neil Robert Anders submitted the thesis Fish Welfare in Mackerel Per Seine Fisheries for being evaluated for the degree of Philosophia Doctor at the University of Bergen. The following committee was appointed to evaluate the thesis. Professor PhD Felicity A. Huntingford, Glasgow University. Associate Professor PhD Stephen Cook, Charlton University. Associate Professor PhD Katja Anberg, Department of Biological Sciences. The committee found the thesis worthy of being defended and the following opponents were appointed. Opponent, Professor Felicity A. Huntingford. Opponent, Associate Professor Stephen Cook. Um, members of the audience will have the opportunity to ask questions uh, and comments after the examination by the two opponents has been completed. To do so, note, look at the screen and uh, notify the email address. You can send it to, that's my email address, <clears throat> and you can either send it by email or you can use the chat function uh, here on Zoom uh, if you have access to that. So um, the disputation now starts with the candidate, Neil Robert Anders, presenting his thesis. So I have the honor to call upon the candidate to take over the screen. Thank you very much, Ivan. Uh, just bear with me. Um, ba -ba -ba. Um, okay, everything look okay? Good. Okay. Yes. Good. Right. We'll start then. Uh, good morning, everybody out there. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, so today I'll be presenting some of the theory behind as well as the results of my PhD work, which has been done here at the University of Bergen and in collaboration with the Institute of Marine Research and has all been part of this IMR hosted CRISP project. And the, uh, the title of the work has been fish welfare in mackerel per seine fisheries. So first, I'd just like to take a few slides to introduce to you the concept of per seining itself. Um, so per seining is a very popular way of catching fish around the world. 
something like 30% of the global catch is landed with this gear type. And it's used to target mainly pelagic schooling species. So here in Europe, that means things like herring, capelin, and importantly for me, for mackerel. Uh, and it's quite an attractive way of catching fish in some regards, because it it's very effective. You can catch a lot of fish in a short amount of time. It's relatively fuel efficient compared to other gear types like uh, trawling, for instance. And it results in catches normally of quite high quality and normally with very minimal bycatch issues. So quite a nice way to catch fish. And um, it's particularly popular here in Norway. We have around 400 uh, vessels registered as per seiners which together take about 75% uh, of the pelagic fish quota. Um, but the majority of that quota is actually taken by about 75 uh, large offshore vessels, um, the type which you can see on, on the picture there on the bottom, on the bottom left. Um, so the capture, of per, uh, the capture process of purseining is quite straightforward. So once a suitable school or aggregation of fish has been found, then the vessel attempts to surround that school with a wall of netting, as you see on the video there. And once the school is surrounded, then the net is closed from below by pulling on the purse wire to trap the fish in a, a bowl shaped net. And then from there, it's a matter of hauling the net back on board, as you see in the video, to reduce the volume of the net and concentrate the fish enough uh, that they can be uh, pumped on board. So the focus of my PhD work has been this final stage of the capture process, this hauling stage. Uh, and as you can imagine, as the volume of the net is reduced, uh, then the fish are forced more and more closer together and they start to become crowded. Um, and related to this crowding process as well, because there's limited uh, water exchange through the net and then there's a large biomass of fish respiring somewhere up uh, several hundred tons in the net. Uh, you can quickly get uh, hypoxic conditions starting to develop. And you can also imagine uh, as the available swimming space is reduced in the net, then the probability of one fish making contact with another or making contact with the gear itself is increased. So you get the potential for injuries to start occurring during this, this hauling phase. And at the end of the capture process, there is two possible outcomes uh, for individual fish. The first one being that the decision is made to retain that fish, in which case uh, the catch is crowded even more, as you can see on the video on the left, so they can be effectively pumped on board. And then once they're on board, uh, they're pumped or transferred into refrigerated seawater tanks at about one degree Celsius, as you see on the video there on the, on the right hand side. And the other possible outcome at the end of the capture process is that the decision is made to release some or all of the catch um, for various different reasons. Uh, and in purseining, that process is what we call slipping, the deliberate release of catch because it is unwanted for some reason. Uh, and like I said, the, the reasons for slipping vary, but here in Norway, it's thought to be down to when, the, or primarily down to when the vessels catch too much fish. So too much fish either for the, the quota capacity of the vessel or too much fish for the processing capacity of the vessel. Right, so that's a little bit about how purseiners go about uh, catching fish, but I also want to highlight that there is a, a few possible undesirable outcomes associated with these current uh, fishing practices. So the first one being that we know from large scale slipping trials done out at sea that when uh, you crowd fish, including mackerel, and hold them for long enough, then you can, it can result in substantial mortality when those fish are released. As you see from the plot, the mortalities can reach almost 100% if the stress is severe enough. Um, so it calls into question the sustainability credentials of the slipping practice in the first place. Uh, and another possible undesirable outcome, we know from aquaculture that when you crowd fish, that can result in a physiological stress response that can have knock-on effects for quality. Um, so there's the potential for this to be happening during per same fishing for mackerel, but uh, we don't know whether it takes place or not. But if it does, it's potentially very important because it could be affecting the profitability of catches. And it can also be argued that the manner in which fish are killed uh, on board the Persane fleet at the moment, arguably can be considered inhumane 
because fish are pumped uh, live and conscious into this refrigerated seawater tanks where they likely die over a prolonged uh, period of time from a combination of hypoxia and cold shock. So you might argue this is an inhumane practice. So uh, what can we do to overcome some of these potential problems? Well, uh, if we look at uh, why these problems have come about, um, a lot of these problems and a lot actually that is related to wild capture fishing in the modern day has evolved, uh, or has come about due to the way in which wild capture fishing has evolved. So since time immemorial, fishermen have gone out to try and catch uh, the most amount of fish in the shortest amount of time possible, because that's how you maximize your profits. Um, so we can say that the traditional approach to wild capture fishing has to be to try and uh, maximize capture efficiency. Uh, but uh, throughout my thesis, we've argued that perhaps uh, we need a change of approach um, where instead of focusing on maximizing capture efficiency, perhaps we should be trying to uh, instead minimize capture and handling stress. And this concept is what we've called in the thesis, uh, the welfare conscious approach to wild capture fishing. Um, so that brings me on nicely to the objectives of my PhD, which was to examine the potential welfare impacts of per se capture practices on mackerel to provide a scientific basis for a transition to more welfare conscious fishing. So uh, why do we think the industry might benefit from a change of approach to more welfare conscious practices? Uh, well, I'm sure a lot of you will be familiar with this plot on the left of the slide there that shows the amount of production from the oceans. Uh, and as you can see, as aquaculture continues to grow and expand, uh, catches from the wild capture industry have more or less remained the same since the mid 1980s. Um, so if the wild capture industry is to increase its profits in the future, it doesn't seem to be that there's much scope to do that by catching more fish. It seems that things are more or less fully exploited. Um, so if you can't increase your profits by selling more, then what you could do instead is try and increase the value of what you are selling. Um, and one way you can do that is by providing the consumer with what they want. Uh, so we've seen re uh, increasingly over recent years, a uh, higher consumer demand, not only for um, high quality food, but food that is from a sustainable and ethically sourced place. Um, so why do we think these welfare conscious practices can help to increase the value of catches? Um, if you remember, the, the, these welfare conscious practices are the ones that minimize uh, stress. So it follows on from that. If you minimize stress during capture and then the decision is made to release those fish, uh, then they should have an increased chance of survival in the future and thereby help meet this consumer demand of more sustainably sourced food. Um, it also follows if you minimize stress during capture, you, it's, you can be said to be improving the ethical standards of the food you're producing and help meet this consumer demand of more ethically produced food. And as we know from aquaculture, if we minimize stress, then we minimize the potential for stress induced effects on the quality of the fish and thereby maintain the flesh quality and help to meet this consumer demand of more high quality food. Uh, so when we talk about welfare conscious fishing, what do we mean by the term welfare? Uh, well, animal welfare means different things to different people, um, but a good definition was offered by Edward Broom in the mid 1980s. And he said that the welfare of an individual is its state as regards to its attempts to cope with its environment. So you can see from that, that an animal which is coping from challenges from its environment can be said to have good welfare and one that's failing to cope can be said to have poor welfare. But like I said, welfare means different things to different people. So that's led to a number of different schools of thought with regards to what good animal welfare actually constitutes. So from those people that are here, here, adhere to a, a feelings-based approach, they say good animal welfare is when the animal is free from negative experiences such as pain and fear and has access to positive experiences. Uh, from a nature-based point of view, Good animal welfare is when the animal is able to lead a natural life and express natural behaviors. And from a function-based approach, uh, good welfare is when biological systems are functioning appropriately and not being forced to respond beyond their capacity. 
Uh, so when we talk about the biological systems with regards to the function-based approach, uh, we're talking primarily about those biological systems that are involved in uh, coping and dealing with, uh, with stress. Uh, so function-based approaches has been the approaches that we've mainly applied during my thesis. A little bit of nature-based, but primarily the function-based approach. Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to take a couple of slides now to try and conceptualize this idea of stress and functional welfare because the two are so closely interrelated. Um, so here on the slide, you see an example of the hypothetical stress response of an animal with uh, time on the x-axis and the collective stress response on the y-axis. So as you can see, when an animal is exposed to stress, you get an initial increase in the stress response in the alarm phase, and then a recovery back to equilibrium levels during the recovery phase. And if the severity of the stressor was to be increased, then you get a larger stress response in the alarm phase and a slower recovery back to equilibrium levels in the recovery phase. Um, but as you can see from both of these examples, the threshold for poor welfare, which is the, uh, the red dotted line there, the stress response hasn't crossed that threshold. So we can conclude from that that uh, stress itself doesn't necessarily result in poor welfare. And then to take uh, another example, um, here the severity of the stressor is even higher. We get uh, a larger stress response in the alarm phase. And then, well, that, that stress response passes this threshold for poor welfare. And then we get uh, some indication of recovery, but a failure to uh, recover back to baseline levels and the animal enters a compensatory state that can eventually lead to uh, important fitness consequences, including mortality. Uh, so we can conclude from that that it is when stress is above the capacity to cope that um, poor welfare states can start to exist. Um, and stress responses are shown on three different levels of biological organization. So when an animal is exposed to a stressor, we see primary level responses. Those are neuroendocrine in nature. So changes in the levels of uh, circulating stress hormones like cortisol, for instance. Uh, we also see uh, secondary level responses, excuse me, that are physiological in nature. So um, changes in cardio and respiratory output and mobilization of energy reserves, preparing the animal for a fight or flight or coping response. And we also have uh, tertiary level responses which are those responses that occur on the level of the whole organism. Um, and those importantly include behavioral change. Um, so behavioral change in the face of a stressor is uh, designed to give the animal an adaptive advantage by reducing exposure to the stressor. Um, so you can see from that then, if you can measure behavioral change in response to a stressor, then you can start to get a little bit of a understanding um, as to the welfare status of that animal. Uh, so with that in mind, I'd like now to take a few examples from the thesis where we've used behavior uh, to try and inform us a little bit more about macro welfare in a per se and capture scenario. Um, so one question we asked uh, during my thesis was whether we could use behavior to try and develop an early warning system to tell us that the fish are becoming stressed in the net, because if we know that they're becoming stressed, and we can make efforts to minimize that stress and thereby maximize the chance of those fish surviving if they are to be released. Uh, so for this work, we had up to about 1500 mackerel out in aquaculture net pens out at Ostevol. Um, and we simulated the stresses or the key stresses of the per se capture operation. So uh, namely crowding and hypoxia. So to induce uh, the crowding stressor, we raised the net pen in the water and restricted the available swimming space for the fish. And to simulate the crowding stresses, we, excuse me, surrounded the net pen with a tarpaulin bag to prevent water exchange and let the respiratory action of the fish inside the net pen take down the, the oxygen levels. And we fitted the net pen with a number of different camera systems, as you can see, uh, to record any behavioral responses to these stresses. Um, so here you can see some examples of the footage we were able to collect. Um, so on the left hand side, you see an example from the horizontally orientated stereo camera. 
And because these images were recorded in stereo, we could start to take measurements of distances between one fish and another and orientations and things like this. And from the vertically oriented GoPro camera, we use that to look uh, primarily at swimming activity. Uh, so if you remember, we were looking for a behavioral signal at sublethal levels of these stresses that we could use as a, a early warning indicator. Uh, so what sort of behavioral changes would it be fair to expect? Um, well, you might imagine that when a fish school becomes crowded, for instance, the spacing between one fish and another is uh, massively reduced. Um, so we expect perhaps some changes in the spacing. And you could, you could imagine similarly when the fish or our fish school is exposed to hypoxia, if anything, you might imagine that they spread out to increase the amount of available oxygen per fish. Uh, so we look for any evidence of these sort of changes in the spacing between fish, uh, but we could find no evidence of a response to our stressors. Um, and we think this was down to, at least for the hypoxia stressor, that the, uh, the severity of the stressor wasn't acute enough to induce any measurable change. And during the crowding treatments, we ran into methodological problems in that the densities reached so much that one fish was overlapping one another and we couldn't uh, make accurate measurements of the spacing between uh, fish. So no luck there. Uh, and you might also imagine um, when a fish school becomes stressed that the alignment between one fish and another might start to change. If the schooling structure breaks down, for instance, the angles between one fish and another should start changing. Uh, so we look for any evidence of that, uh, but again, we could find no response uh, for very much the same reasons as why we couldn't find any response for the spacing between one fish and another. And if you remember, we also had the vertically looking uh, GoPro camera and we use that to look at swimming activity. Um, so one measure of swimming activity we looked at was tail beat amplitude, which is uh, how far the fish kick their tails away from the center line. Uh, but again, no evidence of response. Um, and the other measure of uh, swimming activity we looked at was tail beat frequency, which is how many times they kick their tail per second. Uh, and there we had a bit more joy, as you can see from the smiley face. Um, so we were able to demonstrate that uh, mackerel increased their tail beat frequency, their uh, swimming activity in response to uh, typical per se and capture stresses. So as you can see from, from the plot here, um, tail bit frequency increased in response to the crowding stressor on its own, in response to crowding and hypoxia combined, and also to hypoxia on its own as well. Um, all above uh, control, uh, the respective control levels, as you can see in the green there. So providing that this same tail beat frequency signal exists out in a real capture scenario and we can find a way of monitoring it in real time, then potentially we have a very powerful welfare indicator that we can use in the future to minimize stress levels for mackerel when they are caught. Uh, and now another way in which we've used behavior to try and inform us about welfare uh, was uh, trying to address this question here of whether a newly developed uh, slipping methodology could be considered welfare friendly or not. Uh, so if you remember, slipping is this deliberate release of fish from the person. Um, so in 2014, there was a new uh, slipping methodology developed, which was designed to be not only easy for the fishermen to control, but also uh, would release fish with the minimum amount of impacts upon the fish. Um, and there was a number of different conditions, uh, but the most important for this work was that the fish should be released via an underwater discharge channel through which they can swim freely, as you can see on the, on the diagram there. Uh, so for this work, what we did was hire two commercial per se vessels and ask them to slip fish using this new methodology. And we fitted a number of different GoPro camera systems to various places on the boat and onto the net itself in order to record the behavior of the fish as they were leaving and start to get a bit of a better understanding about their welfare status. Um, so here is some examples of the different types of uh, escape behaviors that we saw. So on the left hand side, what we called uh, oddly escape behavior, we equated this with uh, good welfare uh, because the schooling structure of the fish was intact and uh, they were able to swim nice and freely from the net. 
And another example of a type of behavior we saw is the one on the right-hand side of the slide, what we call disorderly behavior, which we equated to bad welfare in that the schooling structure had completely broken down. Uh, there was regular contacts between one fish and another and between the gear and most likely a reduced chance of survival for those fish in the future. Uh, so what we did was yeah, classify the different behaviors that we saw and quantified the amount of time that the fish dedicated to these different uh, slipping behaviors. And a summary of which you can see here. Uh, so we have herring on the right hand side because we also took the opportunity to look at herring behavior and mackerel on the left. And each line of the plot corresponds to a different uh, slipping event um, with the colors corresponding to the proportional amount of time that the fish dedicated to these different uh, slipping behaviors. So in the blue, we have no escapes uh, when the fish didn't escape. We have uh, in the yellow when the small groups or single fish were escaping. In the green, we have these good welfare orderly escapes. And in the red, we have these um, uh, bad welfare disorderly escapes. Um, so as you can see from the plot, there was a lot of variation, not only between species and between vessels, but also between each individual cast. But the overall story was somewhere in the region of 60% of the escapes could be considered as welfare friendly. But there was still a considerable portion of these welfare compromising escape behaviors, these disorderly ones in the red, somewhere in the region of 25% of escapes could be classed like that. And it seemed like uh, mackerel was particularly prone to these poor welfare escape behaviors. Somewhere in the region of 40% of mackerel escapes could be classed as poor welfare events. So if we're trying to answer this question of whether the method is welfare friendly or not, it seems that the method is okay, but it certainly uh, can be improved. So the next question we asked ourselves was whether we could use behavior to try and inform us a little bit of where we could go about trying to make improvements to the method. Um, so when we looked at when these poor welfare escape behavior, oh, excuse me, uh, uh, tended to develop, uh, we saw there was an increased probability of them occurring the further into the slipping event that we went, as you can see from the, from the plot. There. And we think this was down primarily to the behavior that you see on the video here, that even though there was the opportunity for the fish to leave the, the net, they were fundamentally reluctant to do so because that would mean leaving the schoolmates behind. Um, so what it means is you more or less have to keep crowding the fish more and more and more and force them out of the persane. And in this crowding process, then you get the chance of these disorderly escapes uh, starting to occur. So what we took from this was that if we could encourage the fish to leave earlier into the slipping process, then the chance of these disorderly behaviors should be reduced. Um, so perhaps that's how we can improve the method. But to do so, we would certainly need some more research on the particular stimuli and response of mackerel and herring in this particular scenario before we could find a way of encouraging them to leave more early. Uh, and now just a final example of where we use behavior to try and inform about welfare again was addressing this question of whether we could use behavior to tell us whether a newly developed fish slaughter method could be considered welfare friendly or not. Um, so when we're talking about uh, welfare friendly slaughter methods, we're talking about a method that rapidly renders the animal unconscious and then maintains this unconscious condition until the animal is rendered dead. Uh, so for this work, we were interested in seeing if we could use behavior to tell us that the animal had been successfully rendered unconscious or, or not. So what we did was use three different behavioral measures of consciousness. So the first one we, we, apply, or we used was uh, what we call uh, a tail pinch. So we administered a sharp pinch to the caudal peduncle area of the fish and see if there was any sort of escape response from its tail. So if that indicator was present or there was some movement was recorded as present, otherwise it's absent. And similarly so for a rhythmic operculum beat activity, if there was some movement, then it was recorded as present, otherwise absent. And we also look for the presence or absence of the vestibular ocular reflex, which is uh, where the fish's eyes track horizontal to the horizon as you rotate it around the, the central axis. 
So those are the behavioral measures of, of consciousness we used. And the slaughter method we used was one that we borrowed from aquaculture research, which consists of first uh, electrically stunning the animal to rapidly render it unconscious, and then immersing that stunned animal in an ice slurry in order to induce death before consciousness is recovered, induce death by a combination of probably hypoxia and cold shock. Um, so we were particularly attracted to this slaughter method because it's rather similar to the facilities that they have on board the first, uh, on board the Persainers now in that they have the capacity to uh, chill down large numbers of fish in the refrigerated seawater tanks. So that's why we were particularly attracted to this method. And uh, so what we did, we applied um, this protocol on 25 different mackerel and recorded the presence or absence of these behavioral indicators of consciousness, and then combined those scores into a consciousness index that ranged all the way from zero to in indicate the animal was deeply unconscious and all the way through to one to say that the animal was fully conscious. And here you can see the results on the plot. Um, so before the animals were stunned, uh, where well, you can see the red circle now, uh, they can all be considered as fully conscious. And then once the electrical stun was performed and the animals were immersed in the uh, ice slurry, which is indicated by the uh, black dotted line there. After that was done, even though there was some individual variation, all the animals could be essentially considered as deeply unconscious. Uh, and at the end of the protocol, they were all classed as uh, dead. So it seems that we have a way in which we can effectively slaughter mackerel that is done in a manner that's uh, conducive to good welfare as well. So uh, we should certainly investigate this method in the future. Uh, so those were some examples of where we've used behavior in the thesis to try and understand um, about welfare. But if you remember, stress responses aren't just exhibited on that tertiary level, we also have physiological uh, changes in response to stresses as well. So now I'd like to take a few examples from the thesis of where we've used physiology to try and inform us about uh, welfare as well. So one question we asked was this one here, is whether we could use physiology uh, to try and understand a little bit better about why mackerel end up dying when you crowd them and slip them. Uh, so for this work, we had schools of about 100 mackerel, again, out at Osterval in net pens. And we simulated the crowding stressor in much the same way as before, by lifting the net pen vertically in the water and uh, restricting their available swimming space. And then after we'd held the fish at that density for 15 minutes, then we slipped the fish, and released them back to maximum density. And then we were interested in looking at mortality rates after the stressor. Um, and as we suspected, based on what we know from the literature, that crowding can cause death in mackerel. Uh, so two out of our three crowding trials resulted in some level of mortality. One, a small overall mortality at about 2%, and the other at a mortality rate of about 27% overall. And the, the deaths first started to occur two days after the crowding and continued up till 19 days after the crowding and slipping. Um, but if you remember, we were interested in understanding a little bit why uh, they end up dying. So we took physiological measures as well, uh, primarily caudal blood vein sampling. And we were interested in testing uh, two possible hypotheses as to the cause of death. So the, f the first one being based on the earlier tail beat frequency results, we, we, we thought it possible that perhaps the mackerel are swimming themselves to exhaustion uh, during crowding and dying that way. And the other possible hypothesis we considered was that crowding induces uh, physical injuries on the fish, especially considering how delicate mackerel skin is and causes mortality by that mechanism. Uh, so did the physiological data that we collect, did that support the hypothesis that the fish were dying from physical exhaustion? Uh, so fish that do die in that way, you would expect uh, massive increases in plasma lactate, and you would also expect uh, systematic evidence of acidosis, all down to the effects of anaerobic respiration. And you'd also expect the, the fish to be dying, I don't know, for, for four to eight hours after the stressor has been applied. 
but that didn't really uh, describe what we saw for our mackerel uh, because even though there was elevated lactate levels as you see on the plot there most fish had managed to metabolize that lactate back to baseline levels within, within, about, within about two hours, certainly by 24 hours. Um, and there was no systematic evidence of acidosis. And if you remember, most of our, oh, sorry, all of our fish only started to die after two days. Uh, so it seems like physical exhaustion isn't the cause of death in this experiment, but rather that the fish were dying from physical injuries. So. It seems that they get injuries during the crowding and then these injuries develop over time into skin lesions and cause death by that mechanism because all of our fish, all of our dead, our moribund fish had injuries and the probability of death was much increased when a fish was injured. Um, which is all well and good, but perhaps it isn't the full story as to why mackerel end up dying um, when they are slipped because if we look in the literature, the only example we have of a large scale slipping trial for mackerel, um, in that work, um, most of the fish died within two days after being slipped. Whereas, as I said, in our work, they only started to die two days after being slipped. Uh, so it suggests that there is another mechanism at play in large at sea catches. And we think perhaps that is hypoxia because you can expect hypoxia to happen at a much faster rate and reach much more acute levels when you have massive amounts of bio biomass in the net compared to just our 100 fish like we did in the experiment here. So we think hypoxia should certainly be uh, a focus for future studies when it comes to, to mackerel welfare. Uh, and now to take a final example of where we've used physiology uh, was uh, trying to address this question here of, of whether Crowding stress is negatively affecting the flesh quality of mackerel because we know it can in aquaculture species like salmon, um, but we don't know if it takes place in mackerel. But if it does, it's potentially very important because normally, because that could be affecting the quality of the catch and normally better quality catches result in better prices. So an important factor here. Um, so we, for this work, we simulated crowding in uh, much the same way as before by lifting the fish vertically in the water, restricting the swimming space. But for this work, we not only experimented in net pens, but also did some work in uh, aquarium tanks, this time with uh, smaller groups of fish, 10, 10 to 15 individuals. Um, and as we suspected, based on what we know from aquaculture science, that crowding can induce negative flesh quality consequences for mackerel. So we, uh, we found evidence of increased gaping uh, in our crowded fish. Gaping is this uh, undesirable separation of the muscle blocks, as you see in the picture there. Uh, evidence of a, a change in color, a shift to more red coloration in the fillets that were crowded, and also evidence of softer texture for our crowded fish. Um, yeah, but once again, we wanted to know the reasons why. Um, so from our physiological measures, we were able to demonstrate that the crowded fish had much more acidic uh, muscles at the point of death. And we were able to attribute this uh, to the action of um, anaerobic respiration because our crowded fish were associated with massive increases in plasma lactate as well. Um, so this pre-mortem acidification also continued in the post-mortem phase as well, because we looked at uh, how uh, muscle pH developed after the fish were dead as well. And we noticed the crowded fish reached much more acidic muscle pH in the post-mortem phase. And we also looked at the action of a particular group of proteolytic enzymes as well, uh, the cathipsins. Um, and they were more elevated in the fish that had been crowded. And we also noted that the crowded fish entered rigor mortis at a faster rate and reached a higher degree of stiffness than the non-crowded fish. So if we start to put all these bits and pieces together, we think we have a bit of a better understanding as to why um, crowding can result in negative flesh quality consequences. So um, with crowding being the stressor, we showed in the earlier paper that can result in increases in behavioral activity. And where that increase in activity is uh, severe enough, then you can start to get a reduction in muscle pH due to the action of anaerobic respiration. 
And because the muscle is more acidic, that means that the action of the cathipsins, these proteolytic enzymes are increased, increased activity for lower pH for this particular group of enzymes. And that can account for why you get uh, more gaping in the fillets because the connective tissue between the muscle blocks are being broken down. It can also account for why we saw softer texture uh, because the proteins are being broken down within the fillet. And also perhaps why we get changes in color um, because the reflective properties of the tissue start to change uh, when the proteins are broken down. But there is also other potential pathways as well. So you might imagine intense activity results in a lack of intracellular energy reserves, lack of ATP. And we know that that can contribute to harder and faster rigor mortis because there's a lack of energetic capacity to decouple actin and myosin as they get bound together in the rigor process. And that means there's more physical forces in the fillet and that can account again, I'll contribute to this more gaping that we saw in the crowded fish. And also we know that intense activity redistributes blood to the muscles in order to provide more oxygenation for activity. And that might account for why we saw this shift in more red coloration because there was more residual blood remaining in the fillets. Um, right, so now in summary, I'd just like to take a final few slides to discuss where we think these results can be applied to the per se fishery to try and make improvements to mackerel welfare. Uh, so to start off with the example for fish uh, that are to be slipped, um, we know from the results of paper three uh, that if we can minimize crowding, then you should uh, maximize the survival of fish if they are to be released. Uh, so we can make that recommendation to the fleet now to maximize survival, try and keep crowding to an absolute minimum and physical activity to an absolute minimum from the fish as well. Uh, and we can also recommend that the fleet uses the slipping method that was examined as part of my PhD thesis because uh, a lot of the time and in many scenarios it's able to release fish in a manner that's conducive to good welfare but um, if you remember it wasn't perfect so perhaps in the future, we need to find this way of encouraging them to leave at an earlier point. Um, and also looking towards the future as well, uh, the results of paper three showed that one possible cause of death um, for slipped mackerel was from abrasion, presumably coming, apart, coming about at least in part um, due to contact with the netting. So if we could develop netting material that's less abrasive, um, then in theory, we should help to maximize the survival of fish when they are released. And paper three also demonstrated that potentially hypoxia plays a big role in the mortality of catches out at sea. So perhaps in the future, we need to aerate catches while they're in the Persane to try and mitigate against these negative hypoxia effects. And also in the future as well, you might imagine a scenario where we can uh, remotely uh, monitor tailbeat frequency activity, perhaps by hydroacoustics or camera technology, something like that, uh, to get an understanding of the stress levels of the fish and thereby try and keep uh, stress levels be below uh, an acceptable uh, threshold. Um, and there's also things we can do um, for catches that are going to be retained. Um, so, the results of paper four showed that uh, if you keep crowding to a minimum, then you should uh, help to try, it should help to try and avoid some of these negative flesh quality consequences. So that's a recommendation we can make to the fleet. If you're retaining a catch, then try and keep uh, crowding to an absolute minimum and physical activity to an absolute minimum as well. Uh, but the reason that catches are crowded in the first place is so that pumping can be achieved much more efficiently. Um, so we could recommend try and pump fish at the lowest density possible because that should help to maximize the quality of your catch because you'll be reducing the crowding. Um, but perhaps in the future, we need to start putting efforts into developing new low density pumping technology to avoid the need for crowding in the future as well. Um, and you can also imagine a scenario that um, fish or mackerel are electrically stunned as they are pumped on board to rapidly render them unconscious uh, using the similar protocol to what was examined during my thesis and then we could take advantage of the refrigerated seawater tanks on board 
and induce uh, death by a combination of hypoxia and coal shock by pumping the fish into those tanks. Um, so I'm sure some stakeholders would argue that some of these ideas seem uh, a little far-fetched and off in the future at the moment and I would agree to a certain extent but I would also argue that uh, those sectors of the wild capture industry that start to adopt these more welfare conscious practices they'll be the sectors of the industry that are best uh, best prepared to meet the challenges of the future and best prepared to provide the consumers with what they are likely to want in the future as well. So that is more or less everything from me and I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention and also uh, a big thank you to everybody that helped in all the different various ways throughout the PhD work and I also want to mention the funders of the work as well which was the Norwegian Seafood Research Fund and the Research Council of Norway as well. So that's everything from me. Thank you. Thank you very much for this uh, nice presentation Neil. And I'll just ask you to remain on screen uh, and then uh, we will have some uh, questioning and discussions with uh, the opponents uh, from now on. So I have the honor to call upon the opponents, uh, Professor Felicity Huntingford and uh, Associate Professor Stephen Cook, please. Um, should I, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay. Can you see that? Okay, and can you hear me? Okay, um, so first of all, Neil, I'd like to thank you for an excellent talk and some really, really interesting results. Yeah. Uh, this initial commentary um, is based on Stevens and my opinions of, of the thesis when we read it. And I should say we were very much in agreement in our opinions. Um, and our remit at this particular point is, is to put the work in an international context. And that's what we've done, but I, there were three points I wanted to make beforehand um, on both of our behalves. The first is that we both really enjoyed reading the thesis and we were very much impressed uh, by it, both in terms of its breadth and its depth and the variety of approaches and endpoints that you used. And that will come through as we go on. Um, we have, of course, both a number of points to be explored and these are in the spirit of scientific discourse rather than criticism. And we very much regret that we can't hold this examination face to face in the scheme of awful consequences of this dreadful pandemic. Of course, this is not a huge deal, but we're both very disappointed that, mm. that we can't do this face to face. I should say that because this is being done electronically, the slides that we're going to present have got probably more words in than we would normally put. That's just in case anybody's audio isn't working too well, the, the words will tell you what it is we're trying to talk about. So let me just quickly remind everybody what the main aims of the work were. We've just heard about it, but it's to investigate possible negative impacts of slippage during commercial purse fishery operations on survival welfare and flesh quality in mackerel, and also to suggest ways in which these might be mitigated. The electrical stunning work is somewhat separate because it's not about slipping, but it's still concerned with the welfare of mackerel in captive Persian fisheries, so it fits together nicely. Um, the central aim really relates to two major areas of active international research. And these are the importance of addressing discard issues to achieve sustainable fisheries and understanding and protecting fish welfare. These are big uh, international research areas. And taking those in turn and looking at the discard issues um, to try and give you a feeling of or people who are out there listening, a feeling of, of 
where this fits in, into the international research effort. Uh, we did a quick search in the web of science for since 2010, and we looked at survival of fisheries discards, and we found about 348 publications came out. These were mostly about catch and release angling and commercial trawling, but there were 10 publications on per sailing here. Uh, we also looked at the Cordis website to see where the EU are putting money, just to get a feel for, for what's going on here. And we have a very large number of EU funded projects on fisheries discards. These are primarily concerned with reducing the need for discarding design of gear and so on, rather than actually improving their survival. But if you, so in the context of this first research area, the thesis clearly contributes to an internationally important research field and it's addressing a clear knowledge gap there about what's happening in purse, in, in purse sailing and survival of released fish. On the question of fish welfare, I went through the same processes. Uh, did a web of science search, just pulling up fish welfare, 2,891 publications. And these are mainly about the welfare of fish in aquaculture, but actually 624 of those were pulled out by fisheries and they represent both recreational and commercial fisheries. And six of them were about seine netting and actually two were by the candidate. So, um, and the EU Cordis project, a uh, project list shows 71 projects on fish welfare. These are mainly, the vast majority are about aquaculture, not about fisheries, but one of the discard projects from the previous trawl was pulled up by the welfare search. So there's obviously a welfare component to some of these, discard, at least one of these discard projects. So here again, the thesis is contributing to an internationally important research field and addressing a clear knowledge gap. Uh, and I would just say, re-emphasize the point that Neil made, that the broad international significance, both scientifically and in terms of sustainable feed supply, uh, is increased by the fact that purse saving is actually such a promising way of catching fish for sustainable future fisheries, both in terms of environmental protection, the amount of in relatively small environmental damage that's done, and the potential for, make, for ensuring fish welfare in it. So it's a very important area uh, in which to concentrate research. Now, Steve wants to speak, Stephen wants to speak to this next slide. So I'll hand over to you, Stephen. Great, thank you. I, I, I want to start off by uh, echoing what Professor Huntingford said. Uh, this was a very enjoyable process. Uh, certainly enjoyed your presentation this morning as well. Connected a lot of the dots for some of the questions that I, I did have. Um, I am wearing pajamas. That's the first for me uh, <laughs> for uh, a thesis defense. But I am wearing my very best toque. So, um, all right. Uh, with that in mind, I just wanted to make a, a few comments here again to help contextualize things. Uh, I interact a lot with fisheries managers, and whenever I start talking about welfare or individuals, they routinely remind me that we manage populations, we don't manage individuals. Uh, and so they care about things like survival, mortality, and so on. Uh, they, carry less, they care less about stress and less you can show a mechanistic pathway by which it influences uh, reproductive output and some kind of demographic parameters. Um, fishers, on the other hand, are those that interact with individual fish and really uh, it's their behavior or the interaction with the gear they use or choices about gear that influences what happens to individuals. So sort of this combination of what happens at the level of the individual fisher, which, in, uh, which influences the outcomes for individual fish, and then that's what scales up to influence population level processes or uh, if we think about uh, it in the context of your thesis, it's less of a, a bycatch context here. Uh, it's about thinking about markets. And I think what's really fascinating here is that this, it sounds like this is not being government driven. It's not government saying, hey, we need to improve welfare. Uh, it's coming from uh, the industry. It's coming from consumers. So I think that's, uh, that's really fascinating. What I like about your work is that it really does a nice job of, of looking at a whole bunch of different uh, endpoint, uh, physiological, behavioral, that are, are sublethal or help us understand um, uh, 
the mechanisms by which fish uh, are injured or, or die. So uh, I think your thesis is quite unique in, in that aspect. Okay. Okay. Um, we'll come back to those topics I expect later in the discussion. Um, just quickly to look at now, having looked at the broad aims, just to look at the specific objectives and the key contributions to current understanding that's come out of, of your work. Um, in, one of the objectives was to look at the welfare slip consequences of slippage, it's paper one. And this paper represents the most extraordinary amount of effort at every single level, getting the, getting the ships, getting the cameras in place, collecting the videos, analyzing the videos to get the data out and then analyzing the data to get the answers out. So it's, a, it's generated a unique and extremely valuable video footage of fish behavior during slippage and also a, a very valuable database, uh, which will be a resource for the future. The key finding that overall about 75% of escapes events between both species uh, took place in large orderly schools, leaving in a coordinated way is a very useful insight into what's going on in there. And it, this is natural behavior that's potentially good for survival and welfare. Though as you point out, Neil, there are the other 25% of fish, 40% in the case of mackerel that we need to think about as well. So those are very important findings that make a real contribution to, to thinking in this area. Um, in paper two, where you're looking for non-invasive behavioral indicators for mackerel, um, there is issues to discuss here, but the key finding that tail beat frequency increases in response to imposed crowding stress in particular, and then drops back quickly to normal post-treatment levels. That, that's the key finding. And that does indeed mean that tail beat frequency could potentially be used uh, to provide a, 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 a useful indicator of sublethal stress in mackerel. And that is going to be important both for research and also perhaps for fisheries, active fisheries management. So at that point, I hand over to Steve to, to deal with the next slides. Um, well, I, I, ma I manage them and still do, Steve does the speaking. So Great. can I get you to bring up all the points on there? Yep. Oh, excellent. Thanks. Okay. Uh, so with respect to chapter three, uh, this is the one that you just, uh, you described all of them so nicely. Uh, so this is where we move from the field to the lab and are able to dig in and do things a bit more experimentally. And we'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of, of that later. Uh, here you really explore this link between injury, stress, and mortality. Of course, that's fundamental to understanding uh, why fish die. Uh, both in terms of fisheries interactions, but also even in, in nature, uh, understanding predator-prey uh, interactions. Uh, I think one of the, the key take-homes from, from this chapter is it highlights the importance of the delayed mortality uh, that arises uh, due to the injury from, uh, from the slipping. So, uh, and we'll talk more about delayed mortality and mechanisms a little bit later. Uh, in terms of chapter four, uh, this is where you focus on the effect of crowding stress uh, on flesh quality. Uh, um, you use uh, some novel assessment approaches here, uh, and you also included a, a focus on flesh quality. I don't pretend to be a, a flesh quality expert, so I certainly learned some things, uh, but uh, your presentation actually did a really nice job of helping me to better understand the mechanisms by which uh, stress can influence uh, flesh quality. Uh, you showed that there were several indices uh, of good flesh quality that were lower in these fish that were ex uh, exp uh, exposed to experimental crowding scenarios. And that, of course, offers a, a potential incentive for fishers to engage in welfare conscious fisheries if there's benefits to flesh quality that might affect consumer behavior or um, uh, market values. Next slide, please. All right, so the last uh, one is, is, uh, is focused on the stunning protocol. And as 
uh, Professor Huntingford noted it's the one that maybe doesn't fit quite as well as the others uh, if one were to map out you know the the ideal thesis but it's still uh, I think you've done a good job of of helping to make that connection and put it in the the overall context of um, you know how how do we think about the whole process from uh, from capture right through to handing it off to uh, processors, uh, what we need to think about. So I think in that context, it, it does fit and does make a lot of sense. Uh, you focused on using reflex impairment indicators, something that uh, I've been involved quite a bit with in the context of uh, assessing uh, status of fish that are, be to are to be released in a bycatch or catch and release fishing framework, uh, rather than using some of these more traditional measures that focus on uh, uh, neural activity. Uh, and uh, I think that's interesting and something that actually can give the fishers a tool that could be used in the field as well. Uh, you're not going to hand them, uh, you know, a, a device that can measure neural function and, and have them have them <laughs> uh, deploy that in the field in any meaningful way. So I think there's a, a practical aspect to that. Uh, there's some challenges with that as well, and we'll, we'll discuss them later. Uh, you, this new protocol that you described induces rapid loss of consciousness uh, without impairing flesh quality. Uh, and so that certainly is promising uh, with respect to humane slaughter. Uh, and this chapter in general provides a good example of high quality practical applied research uh, that's really focused on improving uh, fish welfare in real fisheries. And I think that 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 last uh, little statement there sums up your thesis as a, a whole. It's, it's, it's very practical. Uh, it's something that will generate uh, findings that, that can and will be uh, used uh, with uh, relative ease. Uh, and finally, uh, I guess that's where I was, I was going with that last point, uh, the synthesis. Uh, your last chapter is really outstanding. Um, review a fair number of these things uh, from around the globe and uh, it's not uncommon that uh, by the point where people get to that synthesis, they're just they're done, they're exhausted. Uh, maybe you were that way too, uh, but you still uh, you still put in the effort and uh, presented. Uh, I believe I may have said in um, uh, the remarks here that it was probably the best synthesis that I've seen in a, a PhD thesis that I've read. So uh, so mm -hmm. congratulations. Uh, you really do a great job of bringing the pieces together, uh, integrating different components of the work, and really putting them in the context of uh, the current uh, international literature and, and understanding. Uh, but again, doing it with a, a really uh, applied practical lens. And I think that's, that's what matters, uh, especially uh, you know, your, your thesis will hopefully be read by folks other than academics. So I think it'll be of interest to people in the, in the uh, fishing industry. Uh, and for that to have impact, it needs to be uh, synthesized in a, uh, a meaningful way, in a way that's transparent about limitations, but really gets to the heart of the matter in terms of uh, you know, what this means and, and how they can use it. We know that decisions are based, are based upon synthesis, uh, evidence syntheses. That's certainly how, uh, how decision makers uh, in the environmental realm do things, and it's no different in the business world. And so uh, I think you've, you've really done yourself and the science uh, and the fish uh, a real service by taking the time to really dig in with that synthesis and, and deliver what you did. So thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. So. We thought this might be a good place to move on. Um, whoops. Um, I think I might have left the meeting. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Yep, yep. you're still here. <laughs> um, and you can still see my screen. Yep. Um, I... Um, Excuse me a second. Um, so, um, Steve, shall, Stephen, shall we just carry on with? Uh, uh, I've I've some really preliminary questions that I'd like to ask um, about uh, Neil. How did you come to be doing this thesis? Um, <laughs> I mean, I can see. I just wondered what steps. 
through, you know, what, what the professional educational steps that led you here were, mm -hmm, just to get mm -hmm. a feeling from where you're coming from? Uh, well, I did marine biology for my bachelor's degree back at uh, the University of Bangor in Wales. Um, and then after I graduated, I ended up working as a scientific fisheries observer um, down in the Falkland Islands on commercial fishing vessels. And I also worked down uh, in Kamla waters as well, further south towards the Antarctic on a various different vessels down there. So I did that on and off for yeah, close to close to five years and then uh, thought it was time to come back to university. Uh, so I ended up here in Bergen to do my master's degree and uh, my master's project was actually involved with the fish capture group here, which has been sort of the host of my, uh, my PhD studies. And then there was an advertisement for a PhD and I was uh, successful and here we are. <laughs> okay, that's really interesting. Do you think that that experience of five years working on commercial vessels, do you think someone without that experience could have done this project? I, I guess they could, but perhaps uh, they wouldn't have uh, maybe the, the depth of understanding perhaps with regards to how commercial fisheries are operated and the incentives for fishermen as well. Um, yeah, but, so I thought of a, yeah, like a first-hand practical experience of the industry, I guess, yeah. So, so I wanted to ask you in the context of paper one, but I'll ask you now, how you have the, the two research vessels for the slippage studies, you, you, you charted them. Um, yes, that's right, yeah. They were com commercial per se. One, one a more inshore per se, or a smaller vessel of 30 odd metres, I think, something like that, uh, that is designed for, for fishing more inshore in the fjords and also one of these large ocean going vessels, the type that I showed on the slide, the 65 meters, 70 meters, something like that. So, so what was the attitude of the people, the, the fishers who were on the boats to what you were doing? Very helpful. Uh, and interest, yes. yeah. Interested, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had a lot of assistance and no, no feeling of resistance. And they were very interested in the, the data we were collecting. We had video, uh, a little cinema mm -hmm. <laughs> at yeah. the end of the trip, show, show some examples of the footage we collected. So yeah, generally very interested and very helpful, yeah. Do you think they were representative of the industry as a whole? Or, I mean, or were they a particular mm. two boats? They, the, the way the, we chartered the vessel was put out an advertisement and people okay. apply for it. So okay. I would imagine you get those captains and crews and companies that are more interested in conducting yeah. research yeah. than perhaps, yeah. yeah, perhaps there is a range of opinions within, within the fleet, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I want to ask some questions about the very first section of your introduction about animal welfare. Um, and I'm sure Stephen also wants to has things. Shall I begin? Shall I carry on? How, how shall we do this? Sure, if you want to take, uh, I think as we discussed, five or 10 minutes, and then we'll just sort of ping pong back and forth. So okay. I think you're okay. about five minutes in. So if you want to do another five, whatever we can. Okay, yeah. okay. So so if you could remind me when I'm, so, um, oh, hang on, that's not right. Um, excuse me. Um, okay. Um, so, um, obviously, it's, you, it's essential to talk about animal welfare, and you come straight up to this at the start of your introduction. And I've just to make it easier, so we don't have to keep looking. I've, I've lifted bits of your thesis out here, um, and so I, from page twenty twenty, this is what you wrote, and I put this up because I entirely agree with this approach. So you say, providing um, providing the least stressful conditions for fish during wild capture is the best we can do in the absence of evidence-based validation of pain perception. Thus, this is, it is what we should do. So I entirely agree that in fisheries and in aquaculture, function-based definitions of um, welfare are all we can really use. And actually they're very use, they're very helpful and there's a huge amount of work to be done within that framework. Mm -hmm. um, 
but, uh, but you, we've talked about the, there, there are issues to, dis, to be discussed and I'm sorry we're not having our workshop tomorrow. Um, and we can't obviously, you know, I, I, in five minutes, I don't think we can resolve this problem, but uh, we can perhaps flag up some things. You, you, you say you make a little use of nature-based definitions. How do you see the rationale of, of, of saying an animal's welfare is good if it's showing natural behavior? Uh, because um, animals have uh, innate needs that they wish to express, I suppose you can put it that way. So if you're providing the opportunities for the animals to do as they, as they wish, as they would wish to perform, then uh, arguably you're in, improving their welfare by letting them do what they wish or behave in the way that they would wish. And if I were to say that fear and pain are natural adaptations to evolved adaptations for keeping fish safe, um, you wouldn't presumably say these are natural and therefore it's okay if fish show them. Uh, I'm not sure I fully follow Felicity. So. Well, well uh, what is natural is good. Well, fear mm. is natural. Mm -hmm. It's natural for fish to fear. To, to, to feel fear when they're in a stressful, dangerous situation um, because it helps to get them out of and keep them away from. Um, I, you presumably wouldn't argue, therefore, we should keep fish in conditions where they can feel fear. I say, no, no. Uh, you might improve their welfare more if they have the potential to fear fear, uh, to feel fear and pain, you could improve their welfare by making conditions that avoid the potential for those. Yes. Pain and, and, and I, I, I think the idea of nature, but there's some really, really interesting issues, which I wish we could have talked about around the question of, you know, what feels good to an animal? Um, how, what, how, what do animals experience? But of course, then you're, you're slipping into talking about feelings mm. really quite quickly. Um, and, and this, and we're, we're, this is what we might have talked about tomorrow, but and we, we haven't time to, 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 to thrash this out properly, but I wondered just what you see as the contentious issues about which people disagree uh, when uh, the people who, do f who feel that we should try and use feelings-based uh, definitions of welfare if and when we can, which I, I feel, and people who 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 don't, who feel that it's a, 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 a not a helpful question because fish are not sentient and don't have feelings. So, what what do you see as the most contentious areas of debate in terms areas of science here? You know, what what are people arguing about? The, the one that springs to mind immediately is uh, whether fish have the capacity to feel pain or not. It seems to mm -hmm. be an issue not only in the in the popular press regularly pops up, but also in the scientific literature as, as well. And what kinds of scientific evidence to people arguing on either side, what kind of scientific evidence do they use to, to support their view? Mm -hmm. whichever it is um well those those people who adhere to the the camp that say fish have the capacity to feel fear they they point to for instance uh long-term behavioral change in the face of nociceptors or potentially painful stimuli that results in long-term behavioral changes they point to evidence that say fish undergo a, a change in motivational state when they're exposed to potentially painful stimuli. And they also argue uh, fish have the ability to feel nociception and transmit that nociception information to the brain. And there's evidence of some higher brain processing in the brain as well. So for people who adhere to fish feeling pain, these are the sort of pointers of evidence, but there is also the, the other side of the camp, uh, and they argue that a lot of behaviors and uh, yeah, motivational, yeah, complex behaviors, things like that, they can be, they can occur on an unconscious level. 
It doesn't necessarily need a state of consciousness. And if they don't need a state of con like you need consciousness to experience pain. And they say, these behaviors that you see are not evidence of that. And they also say a lot of their argument is hinged on the fact that when these studies have tried to demonstrate fish pain, they say um, they're, they're failing to separate the issue of pain from nociception itself with pain being a, a conscious experience for the fish. Um, they also point to a lot of methodological limitations and interpretational weaknesses of the, the, the papers that have tried to demonstrate uh, fish pain. And I think key to their argument as well is they say that fish don't have the apparatus in the brain to be able to experience pain. So the, the thrust of their argument is things are happening on an unconscious level with fish and therefore they don't have the capacity to feel pain. Okay, um, that's fine and we could discuss this. Uh, Stephen, do you want to say anything here or are we okay? We're good. Uh, when do you want to do the transition, the first transition here? Uh, I've, I've got one point to make sure. and, and then, and then um, so uh, there was one point, one point on your thesis that I disagreed with um, and, and because I couldn't see the logic of what you're saying here. So on page 19, you say um, feeling based approaches rely on animals having access to positive experiences. Um, this leads to the conclusion that improving individual welfare, and, so the, the, the shown that the net welfare impact of wild fish capture fisheries can on, is only negative, leads to the conclusion that improving individual welfare in wild capture fisheries must focus on reducing um, negative impacts as much mm. as possible. It's inconsistent with the feelings-based approach. I, I, I um, was so surprised by this, the suggestion that feelings-based approaches only think about negative, uh, positive experiences that I went to have a look and see what was actually said here. Um, the, the requirement for good welfare is that animals should be free from negative experiences as well as having positive experiences. Um, so I, I can't, uh, it, the feelings-based definition has always been reflecting the concern that animals might be suffering. So it's they've been focused on negative as well as positive experiences. So I I can't I can't kind of I can't agree with the the what you've said in that mm. little bit that I've um I think my 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 the thrust of what I was trying to say was uh or my understanding was that this to provide good welfare under this uh, feelings based approach that the animals should have not only try and avoid these negative experiences but have access to positive ones as well and uh, I was trying to drive at the fact that while, while capture fishing as we know it today doesn't really offer the opportunity to give the animals positive experiences uh leading to uh, to adopting these other approaches to welfare that better fit um Yes, I, I agree that there's no way that capture they could we could provide fish with positive experience during fish capture. But I the way that it's written, I, I think it's probably it, it's that's misleading. But um, and 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 we might come back to that later. Um, so that is all that I wanted to say about. Uh, uh, we, we could talk forever, but um, and it's really interesting and it's very timely to, to be discussing it and perhaps we can have a, a workshop to, to talk around a table about this later and that would be great. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. And uh, Great. Okay, okay. Excellent. Thank you. You can hear me all right. Yes. Yep. Great. Okay. So uh, we're going to start with some definitions and just make sure we're all on the same page. And we're going to start with what is a fish. So can you can you just remind us? You know, we're all fish heads, but what what is a fish? Uh, <laughs> uh, oh. 
I know it's a tough one, isn't it? It's <laughs> ridiculously simple, yet it isn't. So, so go back. So a way to think about it is imagine you open the Oxford Dictionary and that definition needs to differentiate fish from everything else. So you're really, I'm looking for basics here to start with. Um, a fish, I guess you could say swims. I think yep. all fish meet that criteria, but that doesn't define a fish because other things swim as well. Um, uh, <laughs> yeah, it has gills, I suppose. Yeah. So they res they pre they breathe, respire breathe and use gills as the primary organ for doing so. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, you've, you've skipped some real basic stuff. So where do they live? In water. Yeah, that's pretty key. Yeah. Fresh yep. water or salt water. Yeah. Both environments. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But what are they? Are they rocks? Are they trees? They they are alive, living organisms. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but so are insects and trees. So. Um, <laughs> uh, do they have backbones? Yeah, vertebrae. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Um, all right. So, so again, a a fun place to start. Um, so, how does crowding influence the ability of fish to make a living in their their wet world? So, whether that be respiration, locomotion, obtaining food. Can you tell me how crowding potentially would influence those three things? Uh, when the fish would become crowded, for instance, you would have uh, less available swimming volume to move around in. So potentially you get a, a restriction in where you can move and how fast you can move. It's also in a schooling species like mackerel and herring. It means that your schoolmates that you're schooling with, they are closer to you, which can either increase uh, the amount of information that you receive from your schoolmates because they're closer to you. But it could also, if the crowding becomes too severe, it could restrict the amount of information you can receive from your schoolmates. It's a sort of occlusion. You can't see either side of you because they're so tightly packed. Um, feeding, I think, was another thing you mentioned, was it? Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, with a schooling species again, uh, one of the functions of, of schooling, perhaps, is better ability to find food. Um, so if you're crowded together, uh, well, I guess how it depends how much crowding you are under. So very severe, like I said before, lack of information. Uh, but if, if you are denser, then the information of one fish finding some food should be transmitted through the school a lot more readily and faster. Um, and the other was? Uh, respiration. Respiration. Um, here, it, I would imagine it's, it's down to this. Uh, with, with, when they become crowded, the, the flow of water through the school should be reduced. And, uh, for, and also, if crowding is a, is a stressor, then it should induce uh, a stress response that should increase the... Uh, metabolic rate of the fish or the, 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 the need for oxygen. So the, the need for oxygen should increase when you crowd them and therefore the fish should remove oxygen from the ambient water at a, at a faster rate if they are crowded together. And cool. the, yeah, the amount of oxygen per fish should be less, yeah. Great, thank you for that. Um, so you just brought up stress, stress response. So, in uh, one of your chapters, I think it's chapter four, you there you discuss exercise and you discuss stress. So can you remind me what is stress, what is a stress response, and what is exercise? So I, I really want to get at this question. Is exercise stress or stressful? Mm. Uh, well, a stress response is as I, as I mentioned a little bit in the presentation, a, a stressor is perceived and then it 
fires off this uh, endocrine, neuroendocrine mediated stress response. You have these primary level responses that can lead on to physiological changes. So sort of preparing energy reserves uh, to sort of fight and flight and coping response increases in the ability to take in oxygen, things like this. This is uh, sort of endocrine mediated stress response. And if you also have these uh, responses on the level of the whole organism, these tertiary level responses. And this is perhaps where the, the, the link between uh, stress and exercise comes. That if, if the stress is severe enough, it can induce uh, an extreme behavioral response for the fish. And that's where you get this sort of this, uh, exercise part of the of the equation where when the fish is exercising it's in, it's increasing its intake of oxygen to provide more uh, energy for muscle contractions and things like this and if the if the level of exercise is very severe then you can tip over into anaerobic respiration and you start to get this build build up of uh, metabolites lactates and metabolic protons that can lead to this intracellular acidosis and bring challenges to the animal that way as well. Right. So when a salmon is swimming upstream and it encounters challenging flows, is that stressful? I, I suppose to some degree it depends on your definition of what stress is. Um, so I think in the thesis I've defined stress as uh, anything that uh, disrupts uh, the stasis of the fish um, and requires it to sort of recover back to a stasis level. So if a, swam, a, a salmon is swimming up speed, uh, sorry, upstream, and it is uh, that upstream behavior is inducing a movement away from its baseline levels, then you could argue that it, that is a, a a stressor on the fish that induces stress. Yes. Hmm. So, so when you decide that you're going to run on a treadmill or go for a run outside, are you are you doing so because you are excited about experiencing stress? Uh, no, not not that I'm excited about the stress. Excited about uh, improving my health, I guess. <laughs> So it's this idea of, of exercise being stressful is an interesting one. And I fully get, you know, if we, if we assume that uh, right from that perceiving a stressor and then the fight or flight and certainly bursting away high intensity, short duration exercise, um, I get that that is a response to stress hmm. and would have pretty severe physiological consequences. But I think there's also instances where animals can engage in high activity exercise, uh, like think about tunas there. It's kind of what they do, you know, mm -hmm. more or less always. Mm -hmm. um, they're exercising, but it's, not, you know, they aren't swimming around constantly, you know, triggering uh, that neuroendocrine cascade, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, so just, you know, spend some more time at, at some point. I think there's a few places, especially in chapter four, where uh, the idea that, Exercise and exercise and burst swimming must mean stress. I think there's a number of instances where that's uh, not the case. I think um, Carl Schreck's written uh, a little bit about that. Some of his work uh, okay. might be useful just in helping you to uh, uh, to understand that. And I'm at ten minutes, so that's sort of one line of questioning I have. I, I've got others, so uh, I'll pass it back to Dr. Huntingford at this point. Okay. Thank you. Um, now, I'm going to. I, I was. I'm going to share my screen if I can again, um, and it's going to be this one, and it's going to. I think it's going to be. Okay. Um, I've. I've reproduced the table that you. So it's. It's thinking about stresses in aquaculture and fisheries. So. I, um, on page 18, um, you, you, have, you show this table, which is comparing 
the um, the stresses that fish encounter in wild capture fisheries as opposed to fish farming. And I thought this was a really interesting comparison to make. Um, uh, and because it's my job here, I'm going to quarrel with you about it. Um, there were there were some points that made me think. So, so the first thing I was wondering is, to what extent do you think it's true to say that farmed fish are domesticated? Um, they're not domesticated in the same way as uh, cattle or, or a chicken would be, uh, because there's been a longer sort of <clears throat> interaction between humans and, and those sort of ag agricultural animals. Um, so certainly not that level of domestication, but for instance, in, in salmon farming, mm -hmm. th those animals are are bred and selected to be fast growers and put on a lot of weight and things like that. So in that regard, there is some some level of domestication, but perhaps not comparable to these more longer established methods of food production in the um, agriculture setting. I, I agree with you for salmon, but of course there are lots of other species of fish that are farmed. Uh, yeah. Why did you think it was, I, and, and, and I, I do agree with you that the, the salmon that you would see in sea cages off the coast of Norway are not the same as wild salmon. It's a problem in itself. How, what do you see as the implications for, for how for this for for the stresses they for how I presume you put it in here because you thought it the domesticated status of, of farmed fish was, had implications for the stress that they experience. What what do you think the implication is? Well, I, I would imagine that those fish are li lines of, of fish are selected because of their ability to adapt well to the captured scenario. Um, so um, in that regard, they would uh, be, be better able to cope with the type of stresses they were likely to encounter in an aquaculture scenario because they have in a way been bred to dealt with those and it's uh, the, the, uh if you had a wild in comparison to a wild fish as well not just the breeding side of it but also uh there is some habituation with a fish that has been farmed throughout its life it's used to having certain stresses like interacting with humans and being crowded mm -hmm. here on occasion and treated with this and that so you could imagine the the, the stress responses of, of an animal that is not only like uh, genetically domesticated, but also behaviorally as well, it used to be in a sea cage, you could expect that uh, response is a bit more muted than, than a wild caught fish. Yes. Um, so you embrace both experience and hereditary in your, in, under the heading of domestication. Yeah. I, 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 I'm sure that's right for, for, some, for fish that have been, uh, farmed for generations, even if they're not deliberately selectively bred for, for low stress responsiveness, those fish that can cope mm, coping. will have will have in the past will have flourished in aqua and there are others would just have died or not been and not grown to their full size. So I'm sure there's been an element of inadvertent mm. selective selection. Um, so it's an interesting point to make. I I I I would like to suggest that this this uh, you um, you that you are ignoring a number of short term and medium term stresses that farmed fish experience in this table. Um, I don't disagree that that um, typically it's it's what they they certainly experience chronic adverse conditions in a way that wild fish don't and the, the, the welfare stress welfare problems for wild fish capture are quite different. But for example, um, farm fish are quite often handled, they may be vaccinated, um, they're slaughtered of course, and, and sometimes they're short term stresses like predatory attacks or apparent predatory attacks. So they do experience acute short-term stress and in the medium term things like transport 
and then feed restriction that sometimes has to be imposed over days or weeks for various different reasons. And, and a, a disease, if a fish is diseased, that's a medium term stressor. So, so I, I, like, I very much like the concept behind this table, but I, I think it is a bit simple. But so, so uh, I, yeah, I, I, I broadly agree with you. It was it certainly, yes, there is acute stresses in that aquaculture scenario, but uh, I think the intention of the table is more uh, the, the general type of, of, of stresses in general, but there's certainly, yes, there is the, the, the potential there for acute stresses in aquaculture, certainly, yes. So I, I think it's a really nice way of raising the issues and it would be even nicer um, with those included. It's yeah. really my other reason for saying it. Um, I, have, I haven't got any, any more general points relating to the introduction. Um, so I don't know, um, S Stephen, what you, whether you want to, whether you have any more points about the introduction or if we, how would you like to do this? Um, I've already kind of started to delve into some of the, the chapters. So I, I think we can dance around um, in whatever makes sense. Okay. Um, I, uh, there, I, I wanted to ask you some questions about your behavioral categorizations, primarily in relation to paper one, but a little bit into relation to paper two. So, um, so I'm just going to share the screen again then to, to raise those. Um, so, so I, are you, have I, oh, have I managed to set, Okay, 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 okay. I'm sorry, I'm not very used to Zoom. Uh, let me just um, throw this up. Okay, um, so uh, on, I, I very much like paper one. I had some questions about the logistics of it, but I think we've mostly dealt with that in discussing um, you know, how you got the vessels and, and so on. I just would reiterate what an extraordinary amount of work that was involved. Mm. Um, well, there were, there were, I must mention there was a, uh, a lot of help from technicians and co-authors as well. It wasn't just me. Mm. Yeah, you, uh, yes. Um, I, of course, always in these kinds of things, but still uh, it represents a vast amount of extremely valuable work. And, and I, as, I, as I'm, I'm, I think the videos and the data set will continue to be useful over and above what you've extracted from it. Um, I, this is part, so how difficult was it to get the data, the behavioral data from the videos? Um, it, well, it, it wasn't too bad, I don't think. The, the work that was involved in the second paper with the tail beat frequency was yeah. more involved because Primarily this work in the first paper was once once we had categorized the different behaviors that we saw and they were quite distinct from one another that we mm -hmm. saw. So there wasn't a, a great deal of problems in developing the, the ethogram that you see now on the screen. Yes. And even the, the quantification of the behavior uh, wasn't as involved as the second paper no. because we, we were essentially, or I was essentially counting the du duration of these different behavioral events and states. Can, can, um, so perhaps we can certainly talk about... a lot of work, but uh, yeah. not too bad. Um, I, I couldn't, with paper two, I couldn't, I couldn't find a way of accessing this, the supplementary material. Um, did you do inter-observer reliability measures? Um, no, we didn't, no, um, no. Um, and, and to what extent did you, I wasn't quite sure, to what extent did you use image, computer assisted image analysis? You did for selecting fish, did you, and randomizing in paper two? 
in paper two, uh, no, there was no sort of automatic um, okay. quantification of behavior or anything like that. It was uh, for se selecting random fish, we yeah. or I, I put a, a, a grid over the screen okay. Okay. and then generated some random coordinates and selected fish that way. But it was all more or less done manually. Yeah. I, I think that's a very great strength that it was done ra ra manually. I, I can see how tempting it is to use computers to measure behavior, but I think you miss an awful lot. You do So, mm. so I'm glad to hear that answer. Um, to be picky and pedantic, um, coming out of classical ethology, I would say this isn't an ethogram. Okay. Um, and these are not units of behavior. It's a very effective way of, of quantifying the schooling behavior, which is what you're interested in. Mm, but mm. Um, we, needn't, we needn't go into it. Um, the, I was interested by the philosophy behind having a hypothesized welfare impact. Um, and, and I found it very interesting. How did you come to be doing that? Uh, this, this came about from adopting this uh, function and nature-based approach to welfare. So we sort of equated uh, good welfare with as the animals would wish to be behaving in, in, in nature, in the wild. So for herring and mackerel, that means an ordered school. That's how you see them yeah. Yeah. out in the wild. So we equated that to good welfare. And there, this functional part as well can also be in, in, incorporated as well as because schools give uh, like advantages to, to fish. The function of a school is yeah. anti-predator behavior or better foraging abilities, things like this. So that, that's where we sort of brought in the, the functional side of things as well. So we equated these nice orderly schools as you would see with them in, in mm. nature mm. Uh, and that gave, gives them a functional advantage as well. That was what we equated to good welfare and yes. otherwise bad welfare, yeah. I noticed in your the videos that you showed in your lecture that there were a lot of gulls around. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to ask you: Is it has it been documented whether fish, mackerel, or herring, or or any fish after when they're slipped, well, are they vulnerable to predators? Do we know that? They're certainly vulnerable to predators. <laughs> during the capture operation before they're slipped the, yeah. often you see the, yeah. the birds diving down and to a similar sort of degree when they are slipped as well but they they are being slipped under the water as well so they're they're not right at the surface they're a little way down that sort yeah. of removes the possibility for massive amounts of avian predators but uh we, there was one trip actually that was involved with this first paper up in the fjords in Tromsø mm -hmm. and there was uh, large large numbers of uh, killer whales and uh, mm -hmm. all just waiting for the fish to be slipped yes. and gobbled up. Um, it's Christmas isn't it for them? Yeah. <laughs> okay although in, that, in fact if it's killer whales probably being in an ordered school doesn't help you very much. No no they work whacking yeah. them with the tail and things yeah, like that. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. No, I, I thought it was a very interesting I, idea and, and it, it helps to focus. It helps to focus the mind. Um, uh, you're at about 13 minutes. I'm not sure whether you want to do a, another trade at this point. Yeah. Okay. Let's do a trade. I'll, I'll okay. stop. Cool. Okay. So Neil, looks like you're, you're um, standing up well. You're uh, uh, um, you're surviving, so well done. Keep it up. Um, okay. uh, I've got a question for you. Let's let's talk about the benefits and disbenefits, or strengths and weaknesses of simulation versus, you know, real world. So simulation, mm -hmm. you come in the lab or create some sort of fake, but you know, ideally realistic scenario versus hanging out on a boat with commercial fishers and and working alongside them. So can you talk about the strengths and weaknesses? You've done both. So, hmm. um, so more laboratory based, uh, you have a lot more control over the stresses that you're looking at. Uh, you can isolate things a lot better and look at the specific responses to individual stresses or even stresses in combination with one another. So you have a, a lot more control over, over the environment. And if you contrast that to observations that you might take in the field, 
there is a lot of potential stresses going on, different ones that you have no control over and perhaps ones that you can't measure as well. So uh, that's the sort of trade-off that you have a lot more control in the lab, uh, but less control out at sea. And then vice versa, you can argue when you're out in the field, then you're getting a lot better understanding of the actual responses that you can expect from fish in a real capture scenario. And that's the, the, the sort of cost for doing things in the laboratory, uh, where you're not potentially simulating all those different stresses and things like that. So it's, it's, a, it's in the laboratory as a model for, for what might be occurring uh, out at sea. So it's uh, swing, swings and roundabouts, benefits to, to either one. Hmm. Right. So at the end of the day, you want commercial fishers or the fisheries operators to uh, ideally adopt some of your findings. Um, which of your findings do you, uh, you know, so if you take one of your lab studies, one of your field studies, uh, have you encountered anything that would make you think that your field studies are more likely to be used? And if so, why? Hmm. Uh, well, there was there was only the the one field study, which was the the, the first paper. Um, yeah, I, I I suppose there are the results of that paper are a lot more immediate for fishers out at sea. Uh, it's a scenario that they understand. You can show them videos of them actually leaving the purse, saying that's something they're very sort of intuitively familiar with, and you can make the the case that, oh, you should adopt this method because it probably results in an increase in survival. So I'm sure those are a more Im immediate for, for the fishers, yes. Mm. Did, a, a question for you. Um, do you. Do you know what the word co-production means or co-creation? Does that phrase mean anything to you? Nothing springs immediate to mind, no, no. Okay, so um, it's the idea, co-production is the idea that uh, instead of researchers from the ivory tower deciding that we know best and just running off and doing science, it's where we work closely with relevant partners, in your case, the commercial fishing industry, to develop questions, develop mm. the research agenda, to fund the work, to do the work together, to interpret it together, and so on. So it's a process. It's a process by which a lot of applied research takes place. And there's a whole bunch of science to suggest that social science, uh, to suggest that the single biggest thing that determines that or the single biggest thing that somebody can do if they want their work to be applied, anything that, you know, that, that is applicable, whether that be in healthcare or in environmental work, is to engage in co-production. So you may not have known that's what it's called, but I'm guessing you had some elements of that in what you did. So can you yes. tell me about that? Uh, well, actually, all, all the all the papers uh, they had some level of involvement with the industry. Um, yeah, I think it was on, only yeah only the second paper that wasn't directly funded by the industry itself is through this Norwegian Sea Food Research Fund. Uh, so that they, they 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 those were cases where the industry had come and said we have a potential problem or we want more research and knowledge on this. Um, so they've provided the money to do that. And also in, in the second paper, although that didn't come directly from um, uh, the F Fisherman's Fund itself, the, we had um, what you call the reference meetings where we had in input from the industry as well. And actually in, in all, all, the, all the, the projects that have funded my PhD work, there has been some element of these reference meetings where we got feedback from the industry who say, oh, this looks like an interesting avenue and this not and da 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 da. So there was, uh, yeah, industry involvement in, in many aspects of the work, yeah. Great, okay, that's really promising. You can now call it co-production. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, y you can imagine that your work is much more likely to be used and embraced um, than if, if, you know, a magic pot of money arrived at the university and mm -hmm. you did you were able to just go rogue right just do whatever you want and then be like well here's the papers right and yeah. you smack it down on somebody's desk and they're like shredder 
uh, <laughs> you know, what mm -hmm. we weren't involved. We don't, you know, this isn't meaningful. We weren't a part of this process. So, mm -hmm. so I think how we do research, especially when it's applied, I think is really important too. It's not just about the findings, it's about the, the process by which we engage in respectful, uh, collaborative mm -hmm. projects. Well, we've had uh, that sort of been in the back of our mind all the way through through the project in a way, especially this trying to link uh, welfare to quality um, because quality might influence price and that's what the fisherman cares about. He's catching money. Um, so that's was been sort of, yeah, in the back of our mind all the time, trying to make a, make a case that can be readily understood in terms that the industry understands, yeah. I'm going to ask a, a follow-up question. Um, why PLOS One? And I'll, I'll preface that by saying that we know that most fisheries managers and uh, fishers do not go to the primary literature to find their information. But nonetheless, uh, I'm going to ask this question. Why PLOS One for at least, I think a, at least two of your chapters are PLOS One, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so why they're relative to more fishy journals? Um, there wasn't a thought behind it of um, uh, trying to put it somewhere where the industry could find it. It was more uh, here at the Institute, they have a policy of open access publishing. And that's uh, plus one is uh, one that I'm familiar with or that I've heard talk about. And then once we published the first paper in there, we rather liked, or I rather liked the, the process and they want all your supplementary information and all the data behind it so there's a lot of good things that they want i think um so that sort of led to a bit of a momentum towards uh, plus one but uh i think in the future perhaps we can consider some other other ones as well hmm. cool all right uh, i've got about two more minutes here uh, i'm gonna ask you a couple technical questions about blood sampling so in your presentation today, you said that you obtained the blood from the, uh, from the caudal blood vein. So, mm, artery. Mm. or are you able to tell? Uh, you know, maybe it could be vein or artery, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so mm. we usually say the caudal vasculature. Uh, unless you're particularly gifted, uh, you're not going to be able to hit one or the other. And it's one of the reasons we can't do blood gases yeah. with, uh, with blood obtained from, because we don't know which, uh, which uh, system it's coming from, from the, the venous or the arterial. So, cool. mm -hmm. um, other, one other blood question. Um, so we do a lot of blood work in our lab. And one of the things that we spend a lot of time thinking about is how to design experiments that take into consideration the time course. So um, such that the time course of physiological responses so that we're capturing things that are meaningful and relevant. So um, with that in mind, can you tell me how much time elapsed from when you started to catch a fish, say from one of the tanks, to when you had blood in a vial, in, a, in a, either the needle or vacutainer or whatever you happen to use? From the point of taking the fish out of the water to blood sampling? Uh, From the point of where you started to chase it with a net to capture it, to blood sample. Um, the read two, two, two to three minutes at the very most, something like this. Yeah. Okay. So we right, we tried, that was something we were very aware of, a rapid sort of efficient protocol, catch as quick as possible, euthanize it and take the blood as, as, as rapidly as possible, yes. Mm. Good, okay. So the magic number with fish that have been studied thus far is three minutes. So basically you have three minutes to grab a blood sample for it to represent the state of the fish before you started to interact with it. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, there's a few things that change immediately, like things like catecholamines, which are impossible to sample in, uh, in any way other than to cannulate them. But when you're doing sort of a grab and stab approach, which is essentially what you did, uh, you've got three minutes. So that's, that's good. Um, I'll stop there. I'm at 11 minutes and we'll pass back to Dr. Huntington. Okay. Um, I, um, 
Yeah, I'm going to ask a really self-indulgent question. Um, this is something that uh, if we if we had this viva as it would have happened before the pandemic, I would have sat down and talk, hoped to sit down and talk to you about it. Um, and I, I, I link it with, behave, with with paper one because I, I I couldn't access the videos, but um, but I, you showed them nicely in your talk. Mm -hmm. um, I what are you aware of this book? No, I don't know that one. No, Frank. I, no, no. I only came across it by accident, by, by chance. That um, Frank Buckland was a really early fisheries biologist, Victorian. He was in the late 1900s, and he was interested in in fisheries. He was a, a, a inspector of fisheries and very keen on on fish as a as a nutritious food for people on you know, poor people and he was also interested in aquaculture as well mm -hmm. he was the most interesting man his his all his biography that's just been published is called the man who ate the zoo so <laughs> so he was unusual but he basically he talked to fishes he talked to anglers he talked to fishes and and he was a very successful he wrote books that people uh, that, that were bestsellers the sort of selfish gene of, of their time. And one of the, um, he talked, he, he, there's material in here about the behavior of herring when they're captured and about how herring injure themselves against, uh, there's not very much about mackerel, how herring injure themselves against the um, nets and, 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 and so on, which I thought you might be interested in. But the bit that really interests me, he describes and these are mullet fishes, um, and they're fishing, um, that they're using beach seines, but they are doing the same thing of enclosing the fish and then taking them out. So there's no slippage, but they're being caught by. Um, this, is, this is very long, but um, so, so he, he talks about what the mullet fishes say about how the fish behave in the seine as they're being captured. And one of the things they notice is that um, the schools are disoriented to start with, and then order appears and a leader emerges and the leader helps them to escape. Um, so they, they you, you can, I, I won't reach out to you, but he, 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 he's a Victorian writer, so he's like Dickensy. We would have written that in about two lines, but this is how he writes. But they're really detailed and interesting observations about the formation of organized schools and about leader follower interactions. Um, and I, I, so I was, I would think it would be impossible from the videos that you showed of the large shoals to see if there's any leader follower relationship. But in the smaller shoals where you had about maybe 10 fish, mm -hmm. Would it, did you get, did you, do you, did you, would it be possible? Is there any possibility of studying? He, he says it's usually the larger fish, um, but um, is there any way, any possibility of, of getting information about that from the videos that you've collected, do you think? With regards to seeing if the the fish at the front is larger than the other ones, well, and, and if and if there's a lead, if if you have a leader in the shoal that leads the fish out, mm, that's consistently at the front of the pack. Yeah. Yes. Mm, hey, I, I should think so. As long as maybe the the problem we would encounter with that is that we a lot of the footage for that first paper was. Uh, snapshots in a way yeah, because yeah, the camera yeah. was sort of moving with the net and this yeah. and then all the other so uh, providing that that small schooler on or in the frame of the video for mm. long enough perhaps that's mm. possible but yeah. um yeah but maybe maybe i i just wondered if somewhere down the line but i think this would probably be classified as a as a, a, a an aspiration which would never work in reality whether you know, they, they have model sticklebacks that schools of sticklebacks will follow. And if there are leader fish who are leading or, or leading their schools out, mm -hmm. whether you could actually have a little robotic mm -hmm. mackerel or mm -hmm. it needn't even be anything or, or a mackerel just outside the net or something swimming away, mm -hmm. whether that could help to, to 
to, because it's really interesting, I, I think you found that, that they don't come out and they don't come out, and then one school comes out and then the others follow. Mm-hmm. So there obviously is an element of, yeah. of social facilitation going on there. Yeah. I'm the, just the, wondering... the, there must be a, a leader somewhere, Felicity, I think, because yeah. you'd often see them swimming past that opening mm-hmm. and they just ignore it. But it, at some point, one of them will make a decision, ah, let's try swimming yeah. out this way. And then you start to get ah, more of them following. So yeah. there must be a, a leader in that sense. So yes. potentially... Why not have a little yeah, robot yes. mackerel? Yes, it's sort of something. leading the other ones out. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I, I just, I just, um, I, I, I thought it would be interesting to talk about that. I, um, one can get this book as a PDF, so I'll send it to you. Okay, it's, yeah, it's, it's amazing. Mm-hmm. Okay, that 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 um, that uh, I, I did actually have a technical question about the tail beat frequency. Mm-hmm. It's going from you know one extreme to another here, from of sort of hand waving stuff to very precise. But it, you, um, you, you chose in order to measure tail beat frequency. You could only use those traces where the fish stayed in the frame long enough for you to count. Mm, we, we had a, a minimum cutoff of uh, one second. Uh, so we, we said if, it, if it's on screen for less than a second, then we're not going to get a good measure of tail beat frequency. Um, so what we tried to do was count over the longest amount of time possible, yeah. up to, I think, we, we, we chose five second clips, I think it was. Yes. So up to a maximum of, of five seconds. Yeah. So how often did fish zoom past the field of view too quickly for you to to, to be able to collect data from them? Oh, um, uh, such a long time ago. Yes. It <laughs> um, I'm, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure it occurred because I was forever, uh, because like I said, we, we put a, a grid over the screen to randomly yeah, select yeah. particular fish. And I yeah. remember forever generating new coordinates because that yeah. fish wasn't suitable. Yes. Uh, so I'm so, just yeah. wondering if, 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 if you do equate fast tail beating and, and fast swimming with stress, and I, I realize that's, that's a complicated thing to do, whether actually the most stressed fish are, 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 you're, you're, you're not picking up the most stressed fish, because they won't meet that, uh, you know, it's a, it's a, it's an impossible situation. That's, a, but, but I just wonder if you had a feel for whether that was the case. Uh, it was. There certainly, there's the potential for that effect to take place. But a lot of the reasons why certain fish were not suitable was due to the movement of the of the camera as well. Maybe they're at the edge of the field of view, and a little yeah, movement yeah. will take it out of the field of view. Yeah. So there's two, two sort of things going on. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Okay. Mm. Um, my remaining questions relate more to the synthesis section. So I don't know if Stephen has other, I, I've kind of lost track of time. I don't know how we're doing for time. I, I don't know if, um, if Stephen has. Yeah, um, uh, I was asking Professor Fixon sort of on the side, how we're doing timing wise. Uh, it sounds like uh, we're getting to the point where we should be starting to wrap up. So maybe okay. we can move to the, the synthesis. Okay. Um, I need, I'd be happy with another five minutes for what I need to cover, if that's- Okay. Fine. Why don't you go first? And if there's anything that I want to add to it, I can, I can do that. Okay. Um, so I guess my, whether this is synthesis or not, I guess we can argue about, but um, I'm interested in, what kills fish? You know, is it, make sure, yeah. is it, is it injury? Is it stress? Is it both? Can you tell us a little bit about the mechanisms in terms of what you found in, in your thesis? Um, I, th- I think also it's a combination of things happening. So <clears throat> from, from the results of the thesis, there's certainly the potential for abrasion to take place. And there's also the potential for sort of exhaustive exercise to take place as well. And 
those two, uh, particularly injuries, can set off a stress response that can lead to sort of disruption from metabolic baselines, and then that baseline has to be recovered, and then there's a cost to that as well. Um, and also, like uh, the results of paper three also highlighted that hypoxia could play a role in these at-sea catches. And I, I'm not sure whether that hypoxia would be severe enough or long enough to induce death directly, but perhaps it exacerbates these other uh, potential causes of death as well. So you are, you're already swimming exhaustively or swimming a lot, and then add that in, add hypoxia to that, and then the, the the threshold for anaerobic respiration is much lower. I think it's a, a, com a combination of factors. Yeah. Things, yeah. With respect to injury, the fact that you saw some delayed mortality, do you think in the end that was driven by disease? Um, and what do we know about changing uh, pathogens in, in that part of the world? Yeah, I, I think so, Steve. Yeah, there's a the sort of... Is it, is it, once you've got an injury, the the rate that that injury develops into something that you can't recover from would certainly depend on the sort of pathogen load of of where you are. Um, so perhaps that's yeah, like you like we were talking about before the limitations of doing things in the laboratory and small scale setups. How comparable was the the place where we did our work for paper three? How comparable is that to the to the environment offshore? Um, I'm, I'm yeah. not sure. I'm not sure. Yeah, but certainly. Right. And how does that, you know, and to what extent are pathogen? Uh, are there uh, hot spots of pathogenicity, if you will, in in the ocean or in fishing areas, and how will that change seasonally or among years? And so, so there's lots of questions mm. there. I think mm. to know the Tem temperature which, changes and things like that. Yeah. Right. So the delayed mortality value you you observed, how broadly applicable is that? I think at this point that would be a question. Yeah, it's a, I think the results of that paper is best seen as an indication of how how fish might go about dying when they're slipped. Uh, yeah, but you'd have to go and do observations out at sea in a lot of different scenarios across the year in different vessels to sort of get an understanding of how translatable them results are to, to the real world, yeah. Cool. One last question from me. I actually hit on some of my things I wanted to talk about more synthesis wise were when we've talked about the co-production stuff. Uh, but um, can reflexes alone be indicators of consciousness? Um, uh, it's always better to validate your behavioral indicators of consciousness with uh, more definitive measures of brain activity, these EEG electroencephalogram it's sort of a measure of, of brain activity and there is certainly papers out there that have done both at the same time and sometimes they see a lack of concordance between electrical measures of brain activity and consciousness that way and these behavioral indicators um, so the best 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 is to validate with these uh, EEG measures but um, it's quite a uh, technical procedure. I understand these EEGs and not only sticking the things in the brain of the fish, but also interpreting the results you get from them as well requires uh, some level of expertise. So um, these behavioral measures are pr an acceptable way of looking at consciousness, I think, but the, the best best is to validate them with these EEG. But you sort of have to be a little bit uh, pr pragmatic, I think. Right. Right. Uh, quick question. Are they behaviors? Are, um, uh, well, let me think. Squeeze <laughs> on the tail. No, that's like a, sure. well, it is a reflex of behavior. I guess. Right. Admittedly, half the papers that publish on reflexes call them behaviors and the other half have call them physiology. I think it also depends on the measure, something like ventilation rate, uh, which sometimes is, you know, or are they ventilating regularly? Uh, ventilation is clearly a physiological activity, um, whereas response to tail beep, you know, is a behavior, although it's got a physiological basis. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. so um, in, involuntary behaviors. Yeah. So yeah. Very, very last question here. 
Um, is it related to this? Is it possible that a fish can be exhausted? So most of the literature that's used reflex uh, indicators has been in the context of fish that are, are bycatch or caught and released. And we see fish that are very exhausted. So I can have a fish that's totally pooped out, but still very much alive and its reflexes would be absent. So does lack of reflex indicate unconsciousness? Are those fish unconscious? And th th those fish also lack this uh, vestibular ocular reflex? Oh uh, yeah, that's the ones the that are exhausted. One, that's yeah, that, that's because... the one that usually goes when they're toast. So. <laughs> yeah, that, my, my, my understanding is that that one is uh, a more closer measure of brainstem activity. Um, so if that one is gone, uh, I would argue that the fish is unconscious, yes. Mm. Yeah, I wonder then if we even need the other, you know, if, if the goal is to figure out whether they're dead or not, not whether they're going to die, then VOR is probably the most reasonable one, uh, mm -hmm. and the others are somewhat irrelevant. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, I, yeah, I suppose so, yeah. Cool. All right, thanks so much. Thank you. Okay, um, are you thinking of publishing any of the material that you've compiled in this synthesis? I'm sorry, Felicity, there's something popped up on my screen. Can you say again, please? Yes. Um, are, are you thinking of publishing any of the material that you've put together in the synthesis at the end of your thesis as a review? Um, it has been mentioned here in the group. They, a couple of people said, oh, you should publish. And what, on this. what, in what, which, of, there's lots there, so which were you? Uh, I, it's funny, I was thinking about this this week. Maybe the, the, the appendix at the, the back of yeah, this, yeah, this yeah, that could yeah. be a very nice sort of review paper with regards to what we know so far mm. when it comes mm. to per se capture on fish, that could form mm. the basis of something there, a nice uh, sort of, yeah, re review of things. Yes, I, I mean, don't, don't send that one to PLOS, send that one to a fish journal. Okay. <laughs> and um, I mean, I was going to ask why you put it as an appendix, because I thought it was sort of core to what you're talking about, but I can see it was so big, it would, it's probably better as an appendix. But, um, and I was thinking, you know, the compilation of baseline and stress data for the various stress indices in mackerel, I think it's not, you know, you wouldn't get it. You wouldn't want to send it to nature, but but it's really, really useful. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And it took a lot of work, I think, to put it together. So, mm. so I thought that might be that was. Uh, um, there's, there's very little other data with regards to mackerel physiology yeah, yeah. out there. There's very few papers that anybody's looked on mackerel. Yeah, physiology. and 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 yet it's a major fisheries. So, yeah. so that could be useful. Um, I was looking through your list of um you know where next for the research uh, in the and um you 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 say and i agree with you that you know you're, that you want you th in various points you say we need to identify thresholds for acceptable welfare for 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 this index or that index um how 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 would you do that um i don't know supposing i, I can't remember supposing you said well, tail. We'll use tail beat reef because we can measure it in our cameras in our purse ends. We'll lead, use tail beat frequencies, and then how would you set an acceptable limit for use there? Oh, um, I would like to sort of uh, stress the fish over a range of different swimming speeds and mm -hmm. uh, for different tail beat frequencies. Mm -hmm and see how they start to change at the very, very extreme levels and try and correlate that to, to, to mortality outcomes. Yeah. And for like hy hypoxia, for instance, that's a potential important stressor, but we don't know what the sort of minimum oxygen tolerance for mackerel is. So some yes. very nice tight controlled experiments, at what point do they lose equilibrium? Some physiology measures, at what point do they start conforming to the, to the drop in oxygen levels and yeah, some real okay. physiological baselines for hypoxia would be nice to look into as okay. well. Okay, mm. a lot of work there. Um, I was wondering, um, that's where next for the science, where next for you? 
What if you? <laughs> no, may hopefully a postdoc, maybe. Um, so, uh, hmm, here, here in Norway. Okay. Well, I. I but we will see. see. We will see. Well, there's lots of fruitful lines there for you to pursue for sure. Um, I think I'm talked out now. Um, I don't know about anybody else. So perhaps what I would like to say, you know, thank you. That's a really interesting discussion. And, and unfortunately, we can't follow it up over lunch, but there we go. Okay. Okay. So then I'll take over and, uh, and just um, thank the committee and uh, Neil for a very interesting discussion. Um, what happens now is that uh, we will ask uh, the public if there is any questions. Um, and of course, this is a little bit technical. Uh, you, either you have to send me an email or you have to use the, 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 the group chat in the Zoom function. <clears throat> so I have only received one question from the audience in, in by email so so that's fine I'll, I'll try and share it in the, uh, in the chat and read uh, uh, let me see Avian, um, uh, should yeah. I put up the slide with your email address again just think. Uh, yeah maybe you can do that so uh, so we're sure that everybody has a, a possibility to ask questions if there are any um let's see yeah so the fantastic thing about uh, having a, a dissertation on online here is um, that you can get uh, questions from everywhere in the world <laughs> this is a question from from germany uh, essentially asking do you believe that prices for cheap fish like mackerel and herring should rise shouldn't we always have low priced fish for low income people uh, obviously, that's a value-based political question, but uh, but you might comment on it if if you if you if you want to. Um, thank you for your question, Carl. Nice to hear from you. Um, I, I per, from a personal point of view, I would say uh, the way in which mackerel are treated nowadays does a bit of a disservice to mackerel itself. As I, as I said in the thesis, it's a uh, it can be considered as a superfood. It's very uh, a lot of nutrients and a good good, good component of for, for human diet. The fatty fatty fish. Um, so the way in which it's caught and treated nowadays as a sort of high volume, um, cheap price product is, I think, does it a disservice. And perhaps these welfare conscious uh, methods uh, can go about trying to improve. Uh, the way in which we consider uh, mackerel instead of treating it as a fish for fish meal maybe we should be giving it more of a yeah appreciating it a bit more and treating it in a much better better way mm. okay um thank you and i have no not received any other questions so i assume there that we can proceed with a with a, the next step on the agenda, which is then where, where we retreat to a, a, a kind of a side room here in, in the Zoom uh, and discuss the defense for a short, just for a short um, period of time. And then we return uh, to, to, to sort of close the meeting and, and announce our final decisions here. So I don't know, Katja, can you do some magic and bring us into the group room? Yes, I can, uh, I can do some magic. And uh, I would suggest everyone to stay online. Everyone else, we will, as said, return shortly. I'm just doing my magic here. Yes, let's see. Okay.
Hello? Hello, hello, hello. Yeah. Fantastic job, mate. It's really good. Can you hear? I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. Is Steve also think he's still waiting or coming soon? I'm here. Okay, hold on. That's okay. Yeah, I think both of you. Yeah, I had to. <laughs> I only did one of me. No, I didn't. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Evan, you are muted. Yep, there we go. <laughs> so the committee has now evaluated the performance of the candidates and I am very happy to conclude that the committee has accepted both the presentation and the defense. And I will just recommend that Neil Robert Anders should be awarded the degree of Philosophia Doctor at the University of Bergen. Okay. The university board will be notified accordingly. Okay, so now that, that the formal disputation has come to an end, uh, and for, at this point we will give the floor first to the candidate and then to one of the supervisors to say a few words as a, as a closure of this uh, session. So Neil. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Ivan. So um, you know, first off, I'd like to thank both Steve and Felicity, the opponents of today, uh, not only for uh, agreeing to read the, the thesis in the first place, it was a very great honor to have people, such esteemed people, agree to read my thesis, but also for um, a nice discussion today. Uh, and again, I'd like to thank everybody that helped in all the different various ways during the, during the thesis. Colleagues here, it's a thanks group and all the technicians. It wouldn't be possible without a lot of people helping in various ways. And also thank you to my panel of supervisors, one which is here, Mike and Bjorn and Aud and Aral. Uh, thank you very much for guiding me through the process and uh, thank you to everybody at home or wherever you are for uh, tuning in today. So, yeah, thank you very much. So, uh, was there one of the supervisors there? I mean, this is, uh, this is absolutely possible to, to say a few words here since we don't have an opportunity to hold a party. Well, thank you, Owen. Um, yeah, I'd like to. I'd also like to thank uh, both Professor Huntingford and Professor Cook for their their input and and the discussion we've had over the last few months since since Neil submitted. 
uh, it's been it's been very interesting for us all. And uh, we are genuinely disappointed that you couldn't come here and be here in person. Uh, we were so looking forward to further discussions with you and the seminar we had planned for, for tomorrow. So, uh, but hopefully we'll be able to hold open that invitation to you again in the future and we can continue this this uh, fascinating conversation uh, so thank you for your input it's been actually one of the most professional uh defenses I, i've certainly seen uh and so thank you to you both it was a, a very high standard thank you um and to professor enberg and, and fixen for keeping this organized and keeping the show on the road uh under these extreme circumstances uh, it's greatly appreciated and we, we we had a discussion very early on that the priority would be to ensure that, that Neil could finish as planned uh, and you've you've achieved that thank you it's been an outstanding effort on your part so we greatly appreciate it thank you uh, to Neil um, I was very tempted to give him a roasting now but uh, that that will have to wait for for a party uh, when we can, we can do that, when it's not being recorded. <laughs> um, we've actually been very lucky to have Neil. As you heard, he, he came to us with five years of experience in the industry, not as a fisher, but as an observer uh, and as an objective observer of the fishing practice. And, and that brought to us, that, that brought in a lot of skills and a lot of, a lot of understanding uh, which fed in directly into well, his master's and, and later his, his PhD, uh, which we valued greatly. And we valued him as part of the team very, from very early on. Um, I mean, during, during the, it, it was very clear that Neil was completely at home on board fishing boats. Uh, and uh, uh, particularly the luxurious fishing boats you got to work on on this project and compared to the, those you experienced in the South Atlantic. Um, what I've taken great pleasure in seeing, one of, one of the things about Neil is that because of his experience working as an observer alone for five years in the South Atlantic, he's a very independent person. He's very self-reliant. He's very self-resourceful. Um, what I took great pleasure in is seeing him become part of our team uh, and, uh, and learn actually to be self, less self-reliant and to start using the skills of others around him, the, the engineers, the technicians, uh, and start to work in a multidisciplinary area and bring in those skills. And I, I particularly celebrated the way he was, he's worked with Bjorn Roth and, and the others in terms of opening up new horizons into, into the physiological world, uh, which we could only provide a little insight into. And he's, he's really opened up new avenues for himself there, which is I'm, I'm personally very proud of. Uh, you've done very well there, um, and I, uh, that's 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 presence brings us on to the to the future. Um, the future. Well, I very much enjoyed working with Neil. It's been a, a great pleasure, and we're we're virtually local lads. We were actually born only 30, 30 miles apart from each other in in England, uh, and uh, so we've enjoyed that aspect and that humour. Uh, but. I've appreciated his abilities as a scientist and I've seen them grow and he's, he has become a very capable scientist, one with great potential. Uh, and I'm very much enjoy the opportunity of, uh, look forward to the opportunity of working with him again and continue to learn with him. We've, we've learned together a lot on these projects and uh, I'd like to continue that if we, if, we, if we get the opportunity again in the future. So, so thank you very much, Neil. I'd like to give you a big hug now, but obviously that's not allowed. Uh, so uh, that will have to wait for the future too. <laughs> thank you. Can I say, I mean, I just want to, since we are creating um, procedures here as we go, I mean, uh, there, <laughs> there, there, there might be opportunities if anybody else wants to say a few words to, to open their to unmute their microphones and their camera if they wish. Just be aware that you, you're streamed on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> They're all shy. I think I think uh, I think Bjorn wanted to say a few words. Are you are you there? Hi Bjorn. 
Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, yes. thumbs up. Yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, I just want to say congratulations, Neil, yeah. uh, as a supervisor and now a, a colleague. Uh, <laughs> I just want to say uh, I'm very, 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 very proud of you right now. Uh, it has been fun four years. We have a situation where we have a good projects. Uh, we have good co-workers. We have a good candidate. And, and we did a lot of fun things. And uh, this is one of the projects I... I'm going to take with me to the grave. <laughs> I had four fun years, let's put it straight out. Um, I also want to say thank you to the to the opponents. It was a very nice session. Unfortunately, we have to do this in, in video, but uh, but uh, it turns turns out nicely. So uh, Neil, I, uh, Mike said most of the things, but I just want to congratulate, congratulate you and, and we will meet in Bergen soon. Uh, for those coming, I promised to make the beer, and um, so so we can talk later on. And thank you. Bye bye. Thank you very much, John. Take care, everyone. You're muted, uh, Ivan. Anybody else wants to say something? I guess there will be a party at some point later in. Uh... <laughs> things return to normal yeah. when, when Henrik's opens <laughs> okay then I think we can just close the close the screens and uh, end the session so thank you all thank you very are much. we going to have our bubbles yeah. well, I suggest the cheers <laughs> cheers 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 <laughs> cheers for you <laughs> thank you very much for your time cheers We do have friends, Dr. Good. Anders. Take care. Have a good afternoon. Good time, Steve. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I will be in touch again. Bye bye. We bye -bye. will. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. I will uh, end the meeting now. Okay. Thank you so much. It went really smoothly. Yeah. Thank you. All. Most, uh, that was really good. Well, well done, Katya. Well, well